Well, hello everybody and welcome to this evening's event on the ethics of intervention. I'm Gareth Evans, until recently a member of a rather exclusive and small club which has just been spectacularly increased in its membership of former Australian foreign ministers. <laughs> but I guess the, uh, the more immediately relevant uh, qualification that I bring to tonight's event is as the co-chairman just over 10 years ago of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which really invented this concept of the responsibility to protect as a way of organising both conceptually and politically our hitherto lamentable response to the problem of mass atrocity crimes, genocide and other major <coughs> crimes against humanity and war crimes. I've been speaking and writing about the responsibility to protect ever since and in the process getting up the nose fairly consistently of my good friend and colleague uh, David Reef, whose I think the unkindest cut of all was to describe me as writing on the subject with a quasi-religious fervour, but uh, we'll hear more of him on that subject uh, in just a moment. David Reef, of course, as most of you will know, is a very well-known uh, American journalist who's spent a lot of time on the ground in Balkans, Africa, Central Asia, in crisis, conflict situations. A very well-known uh, feature writer, New York Times, and just about every other publication you can think of. Very well-known writer of some important books, including the very moving memoir of his mother, Susan Sontag, um, Swimming in a Sea of Death, a son's memoir. And of course, most recently, the book that he's in Australia at the moment to publicise called Against Remembrance. David's written a lot of stuff on the subject of intervention, uh, including just very recently, and the titles will give you the flavour, I think, of where he's coming from, um, February the 13th in Foreign Policy, Save Us from the Liberal Hawks, uh, November the 7th, the New York Times, R2PRIP, Responsibility to Protect, Rest in Peace. And then uh, back in June in the National Interest, uh, Saints Go Marching In, when I was one of the naive uh, saints mentioned most frequently in that dispatch. Anyway, that's what David's about, where he's coming from. I thought before plunging into um, the very particular issues associated with the international response to Libya and now Syria, it might be useful to spend a few minutes at the outset just looking at the concept of the responsibility to protect itself, the principles associated with it, and asking David to begin with what's not to like about this. Just very briefly, for those of you who are not as familiar as others with what this concept is all about, in short, it's as follows. The problem that's sought to be addressed is the problem of mass atrocity crimes, genocide, major war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. The context in which that is being addressed is of a world which for centuries was famously indifferent to such crimes occurring within the boundaries of sovereign states. <clears throat> the view being taken that the Westphalian principles of sovereignty that have been with us since the 17th century <clears throat> really were not much more or less than a license to kill. Then the second part of the context is the reality that, <clears throat> excuse me, although in the aftermath of the Second World War, the Holocaust and everything else we remember with horror, there was a dramatic increase in the body of international human rights law and international humanitarian law, most notably the Genocide Convention itself, which purported to set new rules against this sort of horrifying activity or indifference or inaction on the part of states towards their own people. Notwithstanding that, very little happened in the decades that followed to make that mean anything at all in practice. And then we had the explosive series of events through the 1990s in which the talismanic events that we all remember and cringe, I think, to think of were Rwanda in 1994, 800,000 people being macheted to death in the space of a few short months while the world stood totally idly by. 
Even more horrifying in a sense, even though the scale was much smaller, catastrophe in the Srebrenica in the Balkans just a year later when 8,000 men and boys were taken out under the eyes of UN peacekeepers supposedly there to protect them and massacred, butchered to death in neighbouring fields. And then the controversy over Kosovo, which was the result of an international, did produce an international intervention, but not one that had any kind of support from the United Nations Security Council because a Russian veto uh, got in the way of giving it that legal authority. And throughout the 1990s, there was this big debate that raged, the debate about humanitarian intervention. The Global North on the whole saying military intervention in these extreme situations was the only way to go, but that getting absolutely no traction at all in the Global South for a whole variety of familiar and perfectly understandable reasons, uh, an anxiety about what the big guys would do with that power if there was ever acknowledged they had a right to militarily intervene. So that's the context and then the concept itself of the responsibility to protect was designed to meet the challenge of trying to create a consensus in an environment of a consensus-free zone about how to react to these situations. And the essence, I guess, of the doctrine or the concept as it was articulated, first of all, by my commission and as it's evolved further over the last 10 years, is really very straightforward. Partly it was presentational which gives rise to the suggestion by David and others that this is really just old wine and new bottles. Partly it was presentational, shifting from the notion of the right to intervene to the responsibility to protect, moving the focus away from the right of big guys in particular throw their weight around and would be putting the emphasis on intervention to rather the notion of the responsibility of everyone and putting the notion on, um, on protection, looking at it from the victim's perspective. So that was presentation, but it was also substantive because the big change from humanitarian intervention language and content of the previous few years uh, was first in terms of a wider range of actors being involved. Humanitarian intervention was all about the big guys sending in the Marines. Responsibility to protect begins with the responsibility of the sovereign state itself and extends then to the responsibility of others to assist it and ultimately to become engaged if it's doing the wrong thing through incapacity or ill will. So a wider range of actors. Secondly, a wider range of responsibilities, not just focusing on what you do in an extreme situation um, but thinking in terms of the responsibility to prevent through long-term structural measures both before things occur but also after the event, post-conflict, post-crisis peace building to try and address the underlying causes of these catastrophes. So very strong emphasis on the responsibility to prevent as well as the responsibility to react. And the third thing that was different was a much wider range of reactions or forms of reaction were built into the doctrine. So it wasn't just send in the Marines, it wasn't just the military option. A lot of attention is placed in the way in which this has been crafted and accepted internationally, at least in principle on, first of all, persuasion, diplomatic negotiation, naming and shaming, diplomatic isolation, then other forms of pressure like target of sanctions, international criminal court, uh, prosecutions, arms embargoes, and uh, things of that kind of a non-military, but nonetheless building the pressure kind. And then ultimately and only ultimately, the option being that of military intervention in extreme cases. And the very last thing to say to set the scene for this is that those who promoted the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine in the Commission report 10 years ago, even though this did not actually feature in the UN resolution which embraced this in 2005, it was very much part of the concept and remains part of the concept of Responsibility to Protect that you only intervene militarily when a number not only of legal criteria, namely Security Council approval, have been satisfied, but also prudential and moral criteria. And those criteria in particular, the seriousness of the harm that you're seeking to halt or avert, uh, whether or not uh, the intent, the primary intent of those intervening is in fact to halt or avert that harm, or whether it's oil or bananas or some other national interest issue. Thirdly, the question of um, last resort, is a military intervention the only reasonable way you could possibly halt or avert the harm in question that's impending or incurring? Uh, fourthly, criterion of proportionality is the response uh, 
actually proportional or is it way over the top to the nature of the harm that you're anxious about? And fifthly, and probably most importantly of all, and this will feature largely, I think, in our discussion of Libya and of Syria when we get to it, is the criterion of balance of consequences, that whatever else military intervention should be about, it should not involve doing more harm than good, putting more people at risk than would otherwise be the case. So, David, you're absolutely free to say that that's a very superficial and fraudulent description of what R2P is uh, all about, even though you're talking to the chief theologian of the doctrine, and that would be a little bit adventurous. But what, in particular, I want you to say, by all means, by all means, uh, by all means, take me on on the description because it is a very quick summary. But the real question I want to ask you, the bottom line is. Described that way, with those elements, what's not to like about the responsibility of protecting? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> and now we can all go home. No, seriously. Um, thank you all for being here. Is there more, rather more of you than I expected? Um, what's not to like? Well, for openers, I don't think the basic relation of power between Global North and Global South is changed by this. You're absolutely right that in legal terms, the, uh, the goal, I mean, the, the, I would stand by the argument that to some extent at least, to an important extent, the military interven intervening side of R2P recapitulates the older ideas of people like Bernard Kouchner, the former French foreign minister and one of the co-founders of Doctors Without Borders, of the right of intervention, the right of interference. You can't translate it exactly into English. Um, but that insofar as we're talking about basically expeditions to prevent leaders in the global south from harming their people, whether it's the people entire or a minority in the country, we are talking about the same old power relations that we've had all along. Yes, there is in, it is one of the great strengths of R2P that it's firmly grounded in the UN system. I, I mean, we, we agree about a lot, just so you're all clear. I mean, one, one, one argues perhaps more fervently, and, and when you know, people talk, they, there are many things that I agree with Gareth about. And, and incidentally, just so you know, the context is clear to you, the, 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 the undertaking of which Gareth is largely the author is an attempt to deal with disgrace. And he deserves all the credit in the world for having insisted against the grain of the Westphalian order, which is far more alive than the people who talk to you about globalization will admit, to try to figure out a way that somehow we could uh, not simply stand by, that instead the famous, there's a had a famous metaphor about the, the Holocaust, about the Shoah the, in, in Jewish thinking. The, the saying was, the phrase was, why did the skies not darken? And they, because obviously there was a theological crisis in Judaism after Auschwitz. Uh, and, you know, what Gareth and his colleagues tried to do was to see if one couldn't darken those skies. And that's an admirable and humane and, and, and extraordinary effort. My problem with it is that I think it leaves too much of the imperial status quo in place, that in the end one still is talking about the US Marines or the NATO or the new rich countries of the Gulf. I mean, if we're talking, we'll get to Libya and I'm not gonna dwell on Libya yet, but I mean, w immediately after the initial bombing raids or rather after the immediate protection of Benghazi, which just so you're all clear, I support it. I, that I did write in favor of. I simply didn't think it should have gone any farther, and I'm not sure Gareth entirely disagrees with that. But as it became clear that the rebellion was stymied, Qatari and Egyptian commandos started being sent in. Uh, the Qataris and the Saudis have decided that in the Middle East, 
in the Arab Middle East, they wish to take a very interventionist line. So I agree, I concede that it's not only the old NATO powers, but the old There's NATO also Nigeria and West Africa and the Echo was Echo Mark. Well, they, and yeah. And elsewhere. But there is, yeah, no, it's fair. It's fair. And had it been a, a regional effort, I mean, as we all know, as those of us who follow West Africa know, ECOWAS was a bit of a shambles, but it could have worked. There was nothing wrong with the structure of it. it I mean, it had to do with force commanders and all kinds of particulars. But I still think that it's, it leaves a situation in which the old, the same imperial powers that have been intervening in the global south forever, I mean for the last 200, 300 years, are still doing it, this time with UN sanction. And then I would go further, I was skeptical of it before, Syria has made me even more skeptical of it because when the Russians and the Chinese vetoed a resolution that was partly inspired by the, 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 the standards of R2P, although I don't believe R2P. I believe R2P is only mentioned in the second Libya resolution, if I'm, isn't it 73? No, both of them. Isn't both of them. But, but you know, R2P has had a, a very big effect, but and in people's psyches, it is a template now to think about things. I mean, again, Gareth is absolutely right about that. But when the Russians and the Chinese vetoed, a whole number of supporters, not Gareth, but a whole number of rather well-known R2P supporters immediately said, well, the Security Council doesn't matter. Anne-Marie Slaughter, one of the leading American U.S. Uh, exponents of R2P and someone uh, wrote, has written several pieces now in the New York Times and elsewhere. She's the former head of policy planning in Mrs. Clinton's State Department, uh, now back at Princeton where she was a dean before and now as a professor of politics. Um, she said, well, we just need a coalition of the willing. Uh, so, you know, it does seem to me that if one of, if, and she's not alone in this, if many of the most ardent admirers, proponents uh, of R2P in the global north are ready to drop the UN part at the drop of the hat, that the old wine and new bottles charge surely has some validity, first point. And then the second point, then I'll shut up for a bit. Um, I'm not convinced. Just for clarification, uh, is it your point that it's okay if the UN Security Council, this present membership, does authorize military intervention, or is that still up for grabs? No, it's. Le I mean, the Security Council is the ultimate arbiter of global security. I mean, either you believe in this global system. I mean, you can want to reform the global system we have, and you have done major things in reforming it. And again, that's why I'm going to be very careful about you know, in the context of what this project, this project is an ad, a morally admirable project and a politically sophisticated one. The pro, and the UN, I don't like the UN system, but it's all we have. You know, lock set of reason, it's a poor light, but it's all we have. Uh, if the Security Council has the right to mandate these things, again, one can oppose it, but it it is, legal but the fact that this the, this what i think syria did what the reaction to the russian and chinese vetoes did was frankly i felt quite vindicated in my skepticism because immediately the r2p people i leave aside mrs clinton's saying uh, and the ambassador the permanent representative of the united states the united nations susan rice saying that this was a disgrace and and you know the the russians and the chinese were blocking the will of the world community i, I when the next time the americans veto a resolution on Palestine. I mean, I hope the Chinese ambassador throws it back in their faces. But um, the, the, um, but the fact that it's so, people are so willing to drop it does make me skeptical of it. And the other thing I want to say, and I'll, I'll literally give the title of this because uh, the rest will be apparent, is I, I've been doing this since I went to Croatia in 92. Uh, at the end of that war. I stopped being, I'm too old for this now, but I, I stopped being a proper war correspondent after the first year of, of uh, after the fall of Saddam. And the more I wa have watched this, and even after, because I still write about the global food crisis, so I get my boots plenty muddy, um, 
these days as well, even at 60. But I'm not sure we know what we're doing. And while I honor Gareth and his colleagues for trying to figure out a structure of how to do things, it seems to me time and time again, our interventions not just in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, uh, Gareth and I agree completely, I think, about Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think there's a millimeter's diff distance between us. But I think even in the interventions that seem morally necessary, we have shown time and time again, and alas, Kosovo is such an example, that we don't understand as much as we think we do. And that makes me very skeptical of a kind of set of legal criteria on the basis of which you can just say, well, let's intervene. Well, let's tease out a little bit more in a moment what happened in the Libya case and how that may or may not have impacted on the subsequent politics and handling of the Syria case. But just go back a moment to your, your threshold position. There's the, the same old, same old power relationships are visible here with these interventions whenever they take root. Well, let me just ask you head on, if that's right, so what if you are protecting genuinely a huge number of people's lives that would otherwise be lost? Now, maybe that's a big premise and a big argument you'll always have as to what difference intervention would make. But it's pretty widely now accepted that a fire brigade, a gendarmerie kind of intervention, 5,000 or so UN troops, would almost certainly have made a gigantic difference in Rwanda in 1994. Absolutely. And I think it's widely accepted, although more controversial, that for all the legal weakness of the Kosovo intervention and for all the arguments you can have about the extent to which the KLA, Kosovo Liberation Army, contributed to the, the horrors that were being perpetrated or begun to be perpetrated by Milosevic, at least it was successful, wasn't it, in stopping another genocidal massacre that there was every reason to believe would have occurred. So maybe, just maybe, on a sort of utilitarian calculus, um, for all the, the problems you identify, maybe sometimes we are doing more good going ahead with these things. What, what is the moral well, calculus? Sometimes, look, first of all, I do not, I, I, uh, Emerson, the American philosopher Emerson said a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. And I think any view well, that doesn't that admit no, an exception that is to say, I am not Noam Chomsky. I do not. I loathe Noam Chomsky. Uh, the the uh, I am not consistently anti-imperial. I do. If the American military had inter wanted to drop the 101st Airborne into Rwanda, in a, in a, after Javi Romano's plane was shot down, I would have supported that entirely. And the fact that that would have slightly increased American hegemony in the world would have bothered me not a whit. The reason that I certainly, I mean, just my own tedious autobiography, have moved from being a kind of liberal hawk, as I was in the early 90s, to being somebody who's now very skeptical of these enterprises, is it seems to me these interventions are increasingly being thought of as first resorts rather than last resorts whenever governments repress their peoples. That's one point. The second point is, Gareth, you, you ask entirely, I mean, with perfect justice, well, what's so wrong about, I mean, if gendarmerie, if expeditionary um, operations can indeed uh, um, Create, uh, you know, save people's lives. Why not do it? The as, trouble as did, for example, the Operation Artemis of the French in the Congo, as did, for example, Operation Pallas uh, uh, with the Brits in Sierra Leone. Those were classic police operations by military powers, which were classically directed at life saving. Succeeded. Where's the rub? Well, the rub is that it. I mean, first of all, I do think, because I actually, I think that the argument you make could have been made about imperialism, to be very blunt. I mean, the history of this, what's called, what scholars conventionally call the second imperialism, was humanitarian. I mean, Leopold of the Belgians was given the Congo, given by the Treaty of Berlin, uh, in uh, whatever it was, 1878, by, uh, on the basis that he would stop Arab slaving raids. 
uh, you know, the, the old idea that, uh, you know, the, the Western idea that we are the humanitarians going to raise up the, the global south, as we now call it, uh, uh, it seems to me something we should think about. And I don't feel that R2P, I mean, R2P is better than what Kushner did, but I don't feel that R2P sufficiently takes that into account. The other thing is, the inter you, I think it is the presumption of the human rights movement of which you are a distinguished part, whether you want to be or not. It's one of the things you've been, obviously not the only one. But that somehow legal issues can be taken discreetly, ETE. I don't think that's true. I mean, humanitarian intervention is an element of global power. It's a moral warrant for hegemony. It's many other things. To just say, you know, send them in if they save lives on utilitarian calculus. Look, on utilitarian calculus, you know, the current Western domination of the international system is killing a hell of a lot more people by unfair terms of trade than uh, are being killed in all these wars, to be blunt in terms of malnutrition, in terms of a whole lot of outcomes. Uh, now, I don't, you know, so I think you just, all I'm saying is not that you should never do it. Sometimes you should do it. The Brits in Sierra Leone and Sicily are a good idea. It turned out that Tony Blair was right, uh, much as I love him, that he was absolutely right and that you could break the back of this guerrilla movement with a, basically with a battalion. What do you say, David, when I remind you that one of the big voices in favour of the R2P concept in 2005, when it was being debated in a rather sceptical environment in the UN General Assembly, one of the biggest voices was sub, Sub-Saharan Africa through the African Union, who went on record through their spokesman to say that, look, the sin of intervention is bad. We all know that in an African context. But the sin of indifference by the rest of the world is worse, and that's why we are supporting this. It's not just a Western, Northern imposition. There have been Southern voices. Yeah, the Secretary General at the time. I mean, if you really want to go further, I mean, he's a Southerner with Northern characteristics. Anyway. Well, that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> You're right about that. Look. It, you know, there are no, I, I'm not, I, I certainly don't present the global, I don't wish to present the global north monolithically, and I similarly certainly think it would be a great error to present the global south monolithically. All I'll say about this is it seems to me as practiced that this has been the same old deal, that we are going to tell other countries and, you know, they're lousy countries, but, you know, if I said to you, as a counterfactual, as a thought experiment, if I said, look, in colonial times, a lot of wars were prevented. It, it I mean, uh, you know, I consider the British Empire a criminal enterprise, but even within that criminal enterprise, uh, they did a lot of good things. They suppressed sati. Marx supported the British Empire in India because they, uh, the British Empire had quite correctly abolished sati, the, uh, the, the obligation of high caste women to immolate themselves uh, at the death of... Would you mm. say, you know, on that basis it's one? Of course no. you wouldn't, not no. for a nanosecond. No, you won't get me going on the, civil, <laughs> the civilizing missions and the other imperial roles that have been played. I mean, there was... No, of course you don't think it for a second, but why do you think you got such a firewall, if I can turn well, the question Well, one of the reasons around. I think that things have changed is that there are now, despite that real skepticism that was so evident through the debate of the 90s, there are real Southern voices genuinely supporting this concept. They're still troubled about the sharpest end of it, the military interventions, but they're sure as hell not troubled overwhelmingly by the basic structure of the, the concept. The sovereign states have responsibility to their own people, that when they abdicate that responsibility or are unable to exercise it, uh, then the international community should step in, first by way of assistance and then subsequently by more robust forms of engagement. That's out there as a matter of agreement in successive debates in the General Assembly. The initial small band of spoilers that you'll probably remember from that first debate mm. with, that I had with Noam Chomsky actually in the General Assembly in 2009, 
the, the voices then were Sudan, Venezuela, Nicaragua and Cuba that were opposed to this almost alone. And now even those voices are muted. The only argument now is really about the circumstances in which military intervention is ever permissible. You don't get now running in the international forums that reflex anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, anti-empire you know, civilizing mission syndrome that you've described. You get a hell of a lot of it in the academic literature still, but not much in the real world of diplomacy that I've noticed. But let's turn to the sharp end cases that have really tested the world now in the last two years, beginning with Libya and now moving on to the, the situation in Syria, where, as we all know, the, the Security Council is paralyzed and horror is occurring. Libya, to begin with. Now, it struck me that despite all the reservations you've just articulated, you also said a moment ago that you were not opposed to the initial intervention in Libya. Okay. When the, under the express terms of the Security Council mandate, a no-fly zone was put in place involving not just planes buzzing around, but the destruction of airports and other command and control infrastructure. And you were not opposed, and I wasn't opposed either, I was supportive of it, um, the application of military force from the air against the concentrations oh, of troops good. that were outside the walls of Benghazi and about to perpetrate a massacre if they'd been allowed to proceed unimpeded. OK, well, that's a start. We're agreed about that. And it's one of the reasons I've said uh, constantly that at least back in February, March, in the sequence of events, these two successive Security Council resolutions, both invoking the principle of responsibility to protect, the first one warning Gaddafi, condemning the violence that was occurring against unarmed civilians and imposing sanctions and threatening criminal court prosecution. And then three weeks later, the express authorization right. of all necessary means. I said that was a textbook example of responsibility to protect, <coughs> excuse me again, at work. Uh, it's perfectly true that what happened thereafter, however, um, has led to, I think, a diversion of views about this with all sorts of people wanting to maintain the cheer squad all the way through, but people like me, and certainly by the sound of it you, getting very, very edgy indeed about what subsequently happened. Would you like to tell yeah. if that's right about that's the right. beginning, Absolutely. it still puts a little bit at odds with the, the theory anxiety about yeah. the forces of imperial well, darkness look, coming in to do these rescue missions. Yeah. But putting that aside, you're prepared to do it, situation ethics. What changed as things moved on after that in subsequent months that, well, that made you more concerned? Well, what changed were t two things. One, I think, and if I had had such an important role in the creation of R2P and in this, as you say, quite rightly, astonishing uh, change in tone in the UN General Assembly, which mm -hmm. is very much the people, the R2P people who lobbied Again, it, quite, it was quite a steep hill in right after the commission, your commission, and by the time 2005 rolled around, indeed, it was a bunch of states that nobody, frankly, whose views nobody thinks are sincere. They may sound good. You may agree with them in theory, but you have to not know who these people are in order to find the... the to find their... They don't have the bona fides, put it bluntly, to make these objections because, I mean, the Cuban government is not in a position to lecture anybody about anything, still less some of the other charmers who were involved in this. Um, the, the problem is, from my perspective, that everything that happened, I mean, uh, just so the audience remembers as, as Gareth will, there were two interventions. There was an 11-day campaign based on the second of the two UN resolutions, 1973, which did indeed not only protect Benghazi, which I accept completely. I didn't, I've never understood the skepticism about Gaddafi's intentions. If a man makes the speech that he makes and Saif Gaddafi makes the speech he makes, it seems to me you'd have to be a damn fool to say, well, he didn't really mean it or you know whatever. I mean, that just seems to me, there you're just making a principle and you just don't, you know, as the, the old joke about Marxism is, you know, if the facts don't conform to the theory, so much the worse for the facts. Now, um, the, the, there was this operation, I don't remember the names of the two of them, but the, the first one indeed was protect Benghazi, destroy the column, 
that was coming across the desert toward it and undoubtedly would have started slaughtering people and destroy a whole set of infrastructures that would have made the air exclusion zones and the protection zones impractical, standard military stuff. The problem is that within a very short time, it became clear that at least from the American and the French point of view, and I think from the Qatari and Saudi as well, that Gaddafi had to go, that this was in fact regime change. And again, this is my problem with R2P, not as, ima not as imagined by you, Gareth, or by uh, Sakhnoun, or by, uh, the sec by Secretary General Anand. I still think of him as the Secretary General, but that's wishful thinking, uh, much as I disagreed with him about many things. Um, the, the point here is it seems like this regime change idea, and maybe we should talk about Syria now, is you know invoked immediately too. The 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 Americans have said you know the Assad Assad must go, and I get very nervous when a doctrine that is meant to be fundamentally about protection becomes in effect a political doctrine about democracy. The argument, of course, that was made in response to that by the P3, the US, the UK and France leading the intervention was that the mandate, sure, was a civilian protection mandate to protect civilian populated areas as well as civilians themselves. And the argument is, given that there are all sorts of people at human rights risk, not just in Benghazi, <coughs> but in Tripoli and in areas that were very much under Gaddafi's control, we weren't being put at risk by concentrations of troops that were attackable from the air, <coughs> but we're being put at risk by goons and thugs who were going house to house, arresting people, torturing them, executing them. How, then, the argument went, could you possibly discharge a civilian protection mandate without turning over the regime. That's the argument. The argument for supporting one side in a civil war was essentially the same argument, even though that's part of the criticism that um, Russia, China, Brazil, India, South Africa, the so-called BRICS have mounted against this. Um, civil wars are what happens when unarmed civilians have to rely on getting arms by whatever means from outside and getting defections from the military in order to pursue their cause, otherwise they'll just die or the cause will evaporate. Civil wars are what happened, that's what you've got to do, you've got to support them. And again, the argument is made that yes, this was a full-scale war fighting exercise of a kind that when I used to write about this, I said, responsibility to protect operations are not about full-scale war fighting, defeating mm -hmm. an enemy, they're about halting or averting harm. But I was thinking about Sierra Leone, I was thinking about Rwanda, I was thinking about Srebrenica, I was thinking about Kosovo too, mm -hmm. but manageable constraint. But really, I was forced to rethink my position on this by those arguments. What do you say to those arguments? They're not bad arguments. Well, look, I may, this may sound very trivial, but I do think language matters. As I said in one of the pieces you cite, if Nicholas Sarkozy, God help me, um, would have said, there's been a rebellion against the Qaddafi dictatorship. It's true that France had very good relations with Qaddafi, but this is a new time, the Arab Spring is here, we didn't have a choice, now we have a choice. We are supporting this rebellion. I might have thought that was a good thing or a bad thing, but I would have no quarrel with it. But it seems to me that when you talk, when you pretend that taking sides in a civil war or uh, intervening is actually humanitarian, I leave aside the problem of the oxymoron humanitarian war, which now trips off the tongues of the French and American and British governments. Uh, I, I do think there is r really a problem with what is being talked about here. If it's really true 
that in order to do the responsibility for, to protect in the cases that will require any kind of military intervention, that what you have to do is regime change. And it seems to me, at least as interpreted by some people who support Again, talking about Anne Marie Slaughter or James Trauber, it's particularly an American phenomenon, I think, it is. Uh, and perhaps Bernard Henri Lévy in France. But I'm not saying that's what you think. I'm well aware it's not what you think. But, and I don't think it's what the other members of the panel thought. But I do think that if that's what we mean by it, then the bill of, you know, then the, the argument, the proposition that you put forward at the UN. To, and convinced the African Union, a tremendous accomplishment. Again, I agree with that. Then it was not, you, you were proposing something that was not the way the great powers were going to use it. And I mean, you know, yes, I have a, I have a kind of bee in my bonnet, and I've had this for many years, that the human rights movement is a kind of secular religion. And it's true that I think of R2P as a kind of manifestation of this, and as an atheist, I'm skeptical of all religions, sec secular or, or, um, or, you know, involving deities of one kind or another. But, I mean, to use a religious analogy, very few uh, powerful moral ideas have remained the property of the people who developed them. Usually, they're distorted and screwed up. And I give you as the best example, Christianity. Ask yourself the question, how did the religion of women and slaves become the official religion of one of the most murderous empires in the history of the world? I to channel Simone Weil. Well, that's a fascinating topic for another day, but let's... Um... <laughs> Let me say, I think you've said something really very important in the point that you made at the outset of that response about the presentation, about the style, about the argument that was actually made at the time by the P3. The truth of the matter is that when these guys went to the Security Council, they grabbed that mandate with both hands and then went away and ran with it and did not come back to the Security Council in any spirit of compromise at all thereafter, saying, look, this is, that's, we're dealing with Benghazi at the beginning, but let's face it, now we're dealing with a wider human rights situation. We weren't dealing with the civil war at the beginning, we are doing it now, but this is why we're dealing with it and why we have to support it. If the argument had been put in those terms, I think, from what I know now about the atmospherics in New York, how it played out then and how it's mm. playing out now, there would have been a much better response. Are you familiar with this Brazilian initiative? The RWP initiative. RWP, Responsibility While Protecting. This is an initiative that the Brazilians, who are one of those most opposed to the implementation phase of the Libyan intervention, they're on the Security Council at the time, still are. And they've said, look, we're not tackling the fundamental principles of RTP itself, but we sure as hell are deeply unhappy about the way it was implemented. And what we're arguing for, and this is a debate that's out there now running in New York, and getting a real degree of traction and getting some positive response at last from France, of all people, and the UK. Not much from the US, I have to say, mm. yet. And the argument essentially is there's two things are necessary. One is, before we approve these mandates, we really are going to have to be satisfied about these criteria of last resort and proportionality and balance of consequences that we've been talking about, but we've never made part of the formal repertoire. That's point one. And point two, there's got to be some kind of monitoring and review mechanism in the Security Council process which will enable these mandates to be reviewed. Not in a way that micromanages a military operation. You can't have a thousand kilometre screwdriver with these sort of operations mm. run from headquarters, political that's or military. You can't. And that's one of the arguments that you've got to deal with with the P3. But this is the point that's being made. And my instinct, and I've been in New York a couple of times in the last two months and debating this with people, my sense is that if this can take hold and if there can be some measure of understanding and acceptance that this stuff can't be just shoved down people's throats but there's got to be genuine consensus about it i think there's a chance of getting back onto some sort of consensual ground when it comes to the basic principles we're talking about it now no doubt it's going to be too late to be of any use in the syrian no, context it can't work for syria. and we'll come to late. syria right now but i think i'd just be interested in any comments you've got to yeah, make no, about I that because you're familiar with, with this debate r2p is a fact i mean you know people like me 
uh, you know, I used to have a friend in Oxford who said losing side of history, only place to be. And, uh, you know, it doesn't very, I mean, R2P is now a fact of international. I mean, Gareth, this is, I mean, this is a tremendous achievement, folks. You know, this doesn't happen very often in world politics, international politics. I mean, this is a new norm. There's no question about that. The question is, I mean, the question, as I said before, is will the norm, in fact, be distorted to a point where if something like the Brazilian proposal is not accepted, I think it will be distorted, NATOized, whatever you want to call it, to a point where people like Gareth may very well not support it in the form that it, it is usually expressed, uh, unlike the Americans and Bernard Henri Lévy, who never met a war he didn't like. Um, but um, I... Uh, the fact that you haven't left means he's probably not as well known here as everywhere else, which pleases me enormously. Um, but the... You saw the that. Who were you talking about? Uh, Levy. Oh, Levy. Levy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'll I laugh. agree, of course, that if there could be some sense that not just the veto-wielding states, but the emerging powers, who are the ones who are skeptical, as you say, rightly, the BRICS. It's South Africa, it's uh, Brazil, first and foremost Brazil. Uh, Russia, I don't include that anyway, it's a veto-wielding power. India. And India, these are, you know, these are sovereigntist countries, profoundly sovereigntist countries with, you know, profound colonial experiences, uh, and they, if you want to maintain the Global South support, you have to have some sense. Again, I agree, not as micromanaging. I mean, of course, you once you approve a military operation, you can't have targets being brought before the Security Council. I mean, that would be absurd. But you do have to have some notion that it can be reined in. Otherwise, it seems to me, it will go the way that I feared from the outset uh, it would go. Before we open up to questions, let's spend a few moments talking about the situation specifically now in Syria, where clearly the Security Council has been paralysed, not only utterly unwilling to go down the path of military intervention, but also utterly unwilling to go down the path of even supporting a major condemnatory motion and, and um, you know, sanctions, targeted sanctions, International Criminal Court prosecution and so on, all of which on the face of it would seem amply justified because this is, I think we no, both agree, an unequivocal responsibility to protect situation in which it started out with unarmed uh, people being mowed down for simply expressing peaceful dissent rapidly morphed into something which is now in the nature of a, an embryonic armed conflict, sure, but nonetheless I don't think oh, yeah. that changes the basic characterisation. We both agree about that. But the reason the Security Council got itself so stuck on this is unquestionably, I think, the backlash, the buyer's remorse about the way in which the Libyan thing was handled, and that's what's led, I think, to some recognition now on the part of the the P3, the P3 uh, that yeah. they've got to yeah, that's right. approach this in a more sensible way, otherwise there'll never be consensus again. But what the hell do we do now in Syria? Um, obviously it is a case for maximum pressure and maximum application of every available technique of political negotiation and persuasion and Kofi Annan and you know, sanctions and all the rest. So I think we'd all agree about that. But is it a case? Is it a case for military intervention? Is it a case even for arming the opposition forces? You say that there's a mood in the US to this effect, but I'm not hearing it. I mean, the US has been very reluctant indeed to go down any of the paths that have rapidly trod in Libya. I think there may be some good reasons for that, but what's your view on no, this? No, look, I think, uh, we were talking about this in the green room before, I certainly think, I think, agreeing with you, that the problem of doing more harm than good is too severe for a military intervention. I entire, and so I don't think it's debatable that this is an R2P situation in terms of, of grave breaches and crimes against humanity and the like that. The fact that the rebels, at least according to the human rights documents, seem to have been slaughtering some Alawites uh, of late uh, simply, I mean, that could have been said in Rwanda about the, the 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 RPF, which also killed a great many people, but that didn't make the an intervention less warranted. I don't see, uh, for me, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Well, I, I I should say quick. Just backtracking. I of course also agree that this is buyer's remorse. I don't think there's any question. People I know who are close to the Russians say 
they thought they had a different understanding of what they signed on to in and you can say the Russians are the Russians, but you, I mean, you either... Well, I don't think anyone ever went broke overestimating the cynicism yeah, okay. of the Russians. No, I mean, sure, sure, and they could have been, bri maybe they weren't bribed well enough. That's what Ghassan Salome, a great expert in it's this the region, worry thinks. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't, it just seems too risky to me. As far as the American view go, goes, my impression, I think your contacts are probably better than mine, but I, my impression is what the, what the State Department wants is for the Qataris and the Turks to do it. Uh, and they hope that they'll sort of take <coughs> a, a leaf out of what the Qataris did when the rebellion got bogged down in Libya and start effectively, uh, as we're doing it without saying it, then you carve out a few areas and the Turkish Air Force kind of slowly starts fiddling without declaring an air exclusion zone, etc. I mean, in effect, kind of intervention, a sort of sub rosa intervention with a hope that <coughs> excuse me, that at that point there'll be mass desertions within the senior leadership of the Syrian army, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the Americans want. Obviously with Afghanistan going south in the way it's going and with you know, with most of official Washington debating whether or not to go to war with Iran. Uh, you know, the last thing the Americans are going to do is intervene militarily. Maybe that's why Mrs. Clinton, who's a pro and a serious person, whether you admire her or not, uh, but an absolutely professional and, and serious and intelligent person, perhaps has been so shrill, because in fact, that's all she can be, really. The common question one hears is, well, what's the big difference between Syria and Libya? There's a lot of support for moving in Libya. Doesn't seem to be any real support for going in directly or maybe through the back door of others will do it. But, but I think when you look at it as objectively as you can and when you weigh these sort of criteria that I've always argued should be weighed, including the crucial one of balance of consequences, more harm than good, there are some fairly obvious differences. You've mentioned one or two of them, but the, the, the relevant ones seem to me to be, one, for a start, the armies are much tougher nut to crack in Syria than was ever the case in Libya. So the, the risks of associated with a major confrontation of collateral damage, an awful lot of people being killed in a protracted war are quite high. Um, and got to be weighed against the number of people who are going to be killed anyway. The second thing is the, um, there's no regional unanimity about how to respond. The Arab League was united in Libya, they're not in Syria, and that really matters in terms of any non-Islamic country having even a finger in that particular pie in terms of the potential explosive impacts elsewhere. Thirdly, again, you've, you've hinted at this, there are serious sectarian divisions within uh, Syria which were really not part of no, this no. landscape at all in Libya. And also real questions about the extent to which uh, minorities, you know, will be... Maybe nobody is that enthusiastic about the Alawites at the moment because they're perpetrating so many horrors through Assad, but, I mean, there are other minorities there that there's a real question mark about how they'll survive and thrive. Yeah, and in, we, in also, an sir, uh, we also have the... Exa I mean, what, what will... I believe that, you know, a Chinese historian in the 23rd century writing of the American war in Iraq would say it accomplished two things. It it led to the strengthening of Iranian influence over a country that traditionally had been its enemy, and uh, it uh, it eliminated Christianity in one of its historic homelands. And I actually think, you know, that's a great risk in Syria, the Christian risk, uh, that I actually worry about a lot, because the, it doesn't seem to me that an intervention will spare the Christians, and to the contrary, I think they'll be the first victims of it. And on top of all that, apart from those internal dimensions, which you spell out very well, I mean, there's the, the regional dimension that a lot of this stuff is going to be done by proxy. Uh, by other powers and players in the region with consequences that are very hard to, to keep in a box. So I think the, the, the reality that we're facing is that nobody is really being very willing for fairly rational reasons mm. to go down the path of military intervention. What we're stuck with is the need to put maximum forms of pressure on this regime through sanctions and other means and just hope that somehow mm. uh, the politics of it can be negotiated in the aftermath or in the and beside them with the exercise of that pressure. It's not a very happy situation, but this is still part of the 
to finish before we open it up to have questions, and this is still part of a classic responsibility to protect response. Responsibility to protect is about getting an end result of protection by whatever means is most effective and actually works. And if you can't apply the military one or there are good reasons against going down that path, uh, there are other options that are potentially available. Kenya, for example, was the most classic yes, you know, right. responsibility to protect situation of we could ever imagine in 2007, 2008, when you remember in the aftermath of the contested election, there were church burnings, there were 20, 30,000 people being displaced from their homes on ethnic That's grounds right. in the Rift Valley. And that was resolved, maybe not permanently, but resolved by effective diplomatic mediation, again yeah. by Kofi Annan who's gone in there. So this is part of the, the repertoire of responses that is available and we shouldn't be too hung up about the military one. Yeah, it's true. I was just taking the positive side of this uncharacteristically, that the most successful uses both of R2P and of the International Criminal Court have been informal back-channel uses. There are a number of instances where threat of prosecution at the ICC has changed the dynamic of a negotiation, uh, including, for example, agreeing to lift the threat if certain things were done. It's not always saying some purist position about. And Anan, who's the greatest ex-Secretary General, whether you know one can talk about his record in office, but I mean, he's been what he's done since he's left office has really been extraordinary, extraordinary in many places. And he did this brilliantly using R2P, uh, basically behind the scenes, and getting that government and the opposition to, to change their policies. Well, David, I think there's a bit more agreement uh, between us, in fact, than rather meets the eye from that exchanges in the public press. Yeah, well, that's, but, uh, that's, that's like, true. Yeah. But let's see how much that can be sustained with question time. Yeah. Please introduce yourself and keep it uh, short. <clears throat> my name is Anthony Adair. Um, can I just first of all say that I think perhaps the reason people didn't laugh at your joke about Bernard Henri Levy is not because we hadn't heard of him, but because it wasn't a particularly funny joke. And maybe people disagreed with your view of him. That's by the by. Um, getting back to the main subject of tonight, um, Gareth Evans's outline of the RTP program is a very, very seductive one. I think many people here would be very seduced by it. On the other hand, you've made some very cogent criticisms of it. So it makes most, most of us left with the uh, threadbare argument of pragmatism. If it works, it works, and if it doesn't work, it's not so good. Can I suggest that one of the problems with RTP is that it's fundamentally as I understand it, dependent, or to a large extent dependent, on the involvement of the United Nations. And I think there are three problems with the United Nations. One is the obvious one, that five countries have a veto, so you'll never get that unanimity of view. The second is probably an even bigger one, and it goes far beyond the United Nations, but we've seen examples of where the United Nations has intervened. What happens after you've intervened? What sort of a mess do you leave behind? What sort of a country, what sort of a, a society do you leave behind? And just a subset of that is that everywhere the United Nations has been that I've been, there's been massive corruption that followed through the large amounts of money that have been poured in. Yeah. So maybe the solution is getting back to your last point about regional blocks. Yeah. If regional blocks support an intervention as the African uh, Union did, as the uh, Arab League did in the case of Libya, maybe that might be the way of getting around the, the, the problem of those, I think, fundamental difficulties with using the United Nations. Well, I mean, uh, two points. First of all, I don't, I, I mean, uh, there's corruption in, in most parts of the world, I suspect even here. Uh, and I don't actually accept your claim. I mean, maybe the places you've been, it's been terrible, but I think there have been a number of extremely successful UN operations in the world. I mean, I find myself in the preposterous situation, having been a critic of the UN for 25 years, of defending the UN. But excuse me, there are many successful UN operations, and if part of the price of that was a certain amount of corruption, well then, frankly, if the guns fall silent and if refugees are allowed to return home, well, uh, I don't care about the corruption. I don't think you should either, uh, comparatively, on a scale. 
Salvador is a tremendous success. Is there corruption in Salvador? Absolutely. Is Salvador better off because of the UN diplomacy? Absolutely. So uh, I think it's a bit nihilistic of you to put it that way. The second point I would make is that I agree with you about regional blocs, in fact. Uh, when regional actors with UN sanctions or perhaps in certain very restricted periods without UN sanctions, uh, sanctioning, excuse me, of approval, uh, act, of course there's more legitimacy. But it's not just the Security Council that's divided, it's regional actors. And therefore, that's what Syria is about. What Gareth said before is absolutely correct. There, the Arab League is not united. That doesn't change the crimes that are going on in Syria at the present moment. So, yeah, ideally, regional actors would all live up to their responsibilities, but they don't. So, you know, that, it doesn't get you out of the same problem you're in to begin with. Look at the tolerance that ASEAN showed toward Burma if you want a good example of regional actors. So I, mean, I, I don't think this gets us any further. Of course, when regional actors are all on board, it's great. And in that case, they can often pressurize uh, some of the veto-wielding states. I think, uh, this is something someone told me, but I, I, it, it makes intuitive sense to me, that had the Arab League spoken with one voice, it's possible that the pressure on the Russians and the Chinese that, were, was ex that the P3 were exerting before the vote might have been successful. Just the premise of your question was that the whole R2P doctrine is really contingent on UN engagement. That's not really so. You need the UN if you're going to formally endorse and have legal authority for military action, the most extreme R2P response. But you don't need the UN for sanctions uh, which are imposed by particular countries or blocs like the Europeans or whatever is, is happening now in Syria. Um, you need the UN if you're going to make a reference to the International Criminal Court in a case where a particular country hasn't accepted the jurisdiction of the Criminal Court. But that's about it. Um, the rest of the time, the preventive strategies, other forms of reactive, persuasive, negotiating strategies can all be done outside. In terms of regional organisations, regional organisations haven't got complete free reign to embark upon military adventures of their own. Under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter, they do have a degree of flexibility to do it without seeking the authority of the Security Council first, provided they get the authority of the Security Council later. But you're absolutely right, as David is, to emphasise the, the, the centrality in the future evolution of RTP of those regional organisations, and I think that's a, a very fair point that's been made. How many other questions do we have? We're running out of time, but if we, we can go another five, ten minutes if need be, but I don't see too many hands. Oh, yeah, I do now. So one down the front and then lady at the back. So, yeah. Is there the possibility, or does it happen already, that R2P might be a deterrent to the would-be tyrant who's thinking about massacring the population but thinks, gee, I might be charged or indeed I might be regime changed? I think the ICC is a better vehicle for that personally. Than, I mean, R2, the military dimensions of R2P are going to be, I mean, let's be serious about this, whether you uh, are more hopeful about what properly done, that is with the Brazilian, if you like, modification that, to which Gareth alluded earlier, that uh, these interventions can be done in such a way as to retain their legitimacy. They're still going to be very few and far between. There are going to be too many points where national interest is going to prevent them. And even where regional organizations, come back to the gentleman's question, are going to have too much at stake in other ways. I give you the example of President Bashir of Sudan, who has been basically permitted to travel freely in African Union countries, despite the fact that most of the countries where he's visit, that he's visited have been signatories to the Rome Treaty. Um, but I think the menace of the ICC has already been proved to be effective in a number of instances. I think we are getting a bit of a culture shift going on here. I mean, the big change that I wanted to achieve when we started this whole commission process 10 years ago was to move from a situation where the reflex response worldwide when these situations erupted was that basically it's none of our business to a reflex response that 
God, it is our business, it's everyone's business, even if there's going to be often profound disagreement about what the particular strategy in response should be. And I think we, we've really seen that. I mean, Libya became everybody's business just incredibly quickly, as did Kenya in 2007, 2008. The contrast was absolutely stark between Kenya and uh, Rwanda in 94. It was all over every front page in the world. We've got to do something. And in the case of Syria, we've been spectacularly unsuccessful in getting a coherent and united international response so far, but it hasn't been a product of indifference or neglect or a reflex sense that's nobody's business. You had the 50-odd countries meeting as the friends of Syria at the weekend. There's an awful lot of people wrestling with this. And I think that message is getting through to a lot of people bit by bit around the world, that there are going to be consequences if this country goes down this particular path. It's not until you get to some pretty sharp end consequences in the criminal court and so on that the, you know, the penny is really going to hit home. But I think the cultural change, the atmospherics, is, is important and should not be underestimated. Last question in the middle there. Yep. Gentleman on the left. I think it was a lady behind no, you, a couple of seats behind, first of all. Well, we'll yes. Did you want to call? If not, OK, yeah. Uh, <coughs> given the reflexive... Um, reactions being overcome in the United Nations, possibly. Would you care to expand briefly on the reasons that you see are behind China's opposition, please? I was a bit, sur right. you know, I was a bit surprised that China came out um, behind Russia with the Syrian resolution in the form in which it was eventually negotiated and put to the Security Council, which did not have any sharp end stuff in it at all. It really was just basically condemnatory and making clear. The indications had been right up until half an hour or so before the vote was taken, and David That's might be closer to this than I was, the indications were the Chinese were going to go with the 13 others that were prepared to support that motion. And it was only at the very last minute that instructions came from Beijing, God knows from who or how, or what the dynamics were in Beijing, that said, no, uh, you've got to oppose this. But the, the Chinese were on the cusp, and I think that indicates what has been a very genuine the evident shift in the Chinese position over time from absolute unremitting hostility to anything in the nature of intervention of any kind That's in any right. internal affair to something which is far more, I think, responsible and recognises that there are situations which just are intolerable. And I think it was really a bit of an aberration that this vote came out uh, the way that it did. The Russian vote was just totally cynical. There's no other way to describe it. I mean, the events in the Libyan overreach of the man mandate, the NATO, you know, the excess of mandate, uh, arguably, all were fodder for the explanatory mill, but they were, um, you know, they were they weren't reasons, they were just explanations of what was essentially a real politics, cynically driven position, which is going to create problems for the future, of course, when you need to do things, you know, which require unanimous or non-vetoed action. Um, if you are going to deal with some of these extreme situations, one can only hope that um, the force of the international response, the hostility that the Russians have been greeted, will over time, you know, bite home and that they'll become a little bit more moderate because I think that is the way the Chinese are going. Maybe I'm just a naive optimist on this as on so many other things, but I think um, I think that's the case. David? I think, that, I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, the, the, everyone at the UN believes that the Chinese were had given assurances. The Americans certainly believed that they had assurances. Susan Rice believed that she had assurances from the Chinese permanent representative that China would either abstain or vote yes. Uh, my own view, for what it's worth, is this was just sticking one in the eye of the Americans, that the Chinese don't care all that much one way or the other about Syria. It's far away. But that they feel the Americans are just, were getting a little too big for their britches, and, and so they would join the Russians, which was, after all, a largely symbolic vote. After all, Russia was always going to veto. The problem in the, I mean, the, the problem in an excessive association if one exists, and if the Brazilian amendment is adopted and can be shown to work, maybe this will all be a moot point. But if uh, R2P is too much associated with the P3, then you will have uh, a problem, because then the P3 itself will not get involved, say, in Bahrain. Uh, and you know, then we're going to start 
we're getting into another set of problems that we haven't even described. After all, there was an, a repressive intervention that took place during the Arab Spring that was not met with the indignation that Mr. Gaddafi and, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Mubarak's and Mr. Ben Ali's uh, actions were met with because, of course, it was a P3 ally. Again, there are ways around this. This doesn't condemn the thing to futility or to or or or, but it it is a a, a problem in the Russian case. You see, Bahrain would have been, I mean, imagine for the sake of argument that Russia had brought before the Security Council an R2P resolution on, on Bahrain. Uh, the Americans would have had to veto it. Uh, and uh, so, it, you know, Russia, uh, I mean, Syria is a Russian ally. It's pure realpolitik, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not the base. I don't think it's that. It's part of the complicated relations between Russia, Syria, and Iran. Uh, but... You know, the, the other thing, but I, you know, my own view is the Chinese, I agree entirely with Gareth, the, the Chinese uh, have shown in Sudan how far they've moved in the last 10 years. It's quite remarkable. They are interested to a greater extent, certainly, than I would have ever imagined in a shorter time in becoming involved in multilateral operations. Hmm. Well, I think we should wrap it up there and let you get off to dinner. Thank you for being such an attentive yes, audience. Thank you, and thank you, David, for coming to visit us. <laughs>